at me tonight. I have been staring at a screen, looking at myself and others for the past two years. So I'm really excited to be here tonight and to hang out with you. So we do have a small group, so I encourage uh, questions this evening. So if, if I'm not able to completely go over the concept, um, just raise your hand and I can do my best to um, provide more information. Um, so we are going to be talking about wildflowers tonight. Um, and before we do so, um, I wanted to go over a quick outline about uh, this presentation. So I work for the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, also known as TINS, and we're going to go over who is TINS. Um, in addition, we're going to talk about just basic plant ID, uh, different parts of plants and flowers. Um, and then we're going to go into the breadth of the uh, presentation and go over very common uh, flowers here in the Tahoe Basin and then some other unique flowers you can find in some rare areas. Um, and then we'll talk briefly on other plants because there's so many different things out there. Uh, where to find these flowers um, and then how to get involved with things. So, uh, who is Tent? So, who is the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science? Um, we are a member supported nonprofit with the goal of connecting people to nature. And we have uh, three different ways that we do that. Number one is uh, Kendall, Scott, and myself. We work under Dr. Will Richardson's PhD. He's a biologist here in the area. And we collect local data on various uh, natural history or flora and fauna. And then we provide that, if we take that information and we bring it to the public in a couple different ways. One of those ways is we bring it into uh, the, the, all the schools here in the area. So K through fifth grade, we have programming um, for children. And so we take kids outside and, and immerse them in nature. So this is an AP environmental science student uh, learning about uh, uh, the physics of flight with birds and getting outside at Chickpea Ridge. Um, we have hands-on activities. So uh, we get the kids outside touching the animals, uh, learning um, and uh, understanding what surrounds them. Because if you don't know what surrounds you, why would you care about it, right? Um, and then we also take students outside to teach them about the science and the data that we collect. So um, right here, here's Dr. Will Richardson. He has a female uh, black-headed gross beak in his hand, and he's banding that bird. So uh, the kids are able to watch actual scientists collecting data in their hometown to, to understand maybe something that they can do in their futures. Um, and here's a, a kid at kids camp. So we have all these different science camps for kids, whether it's bug catching or bird watching or hiking up Shirley Canyon. We've done that before, it's tough, but we get them up there. Um, I've also created the local bird club um, at the elementary school. Um, it started off with just a few kids and now we have to have a cap on the bird club um, here at Incline Elementary School. Um, but the kids wake up earlier than most of my friends to come bird watching with me uh, before they go to school. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Some ways that you can get involved um, are coming out with us in the field. So we give these presentations, just basics of different natural history concepts, but all of our programming is free. Um, so uh, join us on a nature walk, whether that's a wildflower walk or a bird walk. Um, we also have people participate in what we call citizen science, and Kendall will talk about that a little bit later. So you came here to learn about wildflowers, um, but we have to start with the basics, because as we look at wildflowers throughout the presentation, I'll be pointing out different parts of the flower, and I want you to understand what those parts are. Um, so we live in a very unique area here in the Tahoe region. There's a lot of uh, topographic change, there's a lot of uh, growth factors that encapsulate whether or not plants can grow. And so if you look all around our mountains, we have a lot of granite mountaintops, right? A lot of granitic soils. But then you can go to marshy areas where we have really spongy uh, grounds where there's different um, flowers that are growing there. So depending on the particle size will help uh, determine what type of plants will grow with. So meadow or small par uh, particles um, or soil particles will have a complete different set of wildfires opposed to the slopey, slopey granitic um, soils of the Mount, of Mount Rose. So other growth factors um, include temperature. So we, there's variable temperature here in the area, really cold nights, really warm days. 
Uh, precipitation or snow levels. Snowpack will also determine what type of plants grow in the area. And wind, so overall climate and soils. Back to the topography, um, what's really interesting is we have very exposed mountain slopes. So earlier in the season, you might have a, a wildflower, and then it dries up, and then you go up a thousand feet, and then you re-see that uh, wildflower again. So sometimes if you feel like you're too late to see a flower, you might just have to hike up a little higher to see that flower later. But also, um, different flowers have to grow at different elevations too. So that's something I'll be pointing out throughout the presentation. Another uh, growth factor are biotic relationships. So symbiotic relationships or parasitic relationships, mutualistic uh, relationships with uh, other fauna. So for example, a columbine wouldn't be able, or a, a crimson columbine wouldn't be able to be around if it didn't have hummingbirds pollinating. Or our white bark pine trees would not be as prevalent where we snowboard and ski unless we had Clark's nutcracker taking those seeds germinating in the soil at the perfect depth and regrowing those trees. So biotic factors are really important when it comes to uh, plant growth. And something I did want to point out before we get into the presentation, there's such a vast, wide variety of different things you can do with wildflowers. There's identification, where you're going out there, you have your field guide. But there's also more than that. There's just appreciation, just being in an area that has a lot of color. Um, you can also uh, immerse yourself by photography, sketching, um, and even teaching others how to identify flowers, too. So um, I'm going to hopefully excite you on a, a few flowers that I found to be pretty important, um, and then you do what you would like with that information. So a couple things, again, about parts of a flower. Um, not all flowers have this, but there are male parts of a flower and female parts of a flower. Not all flowers have both parts, but in a perfect flower, they do. So I want to just quickly go over the different parts of that flower. So this long, um, large piece in the very center of the flower is the female part of the flower. Okay, that's where seeds are produced. Um, basically, uh, uh, an ovary is what's going to eventually turn into a fruit. Uh, and the ovules are what are eventually going to turn into a seed. Okay. Um, and then the male parts of the flowers are these stamens. And so in this lily here, there's six stamens. And that is the pollen-producing part of the flower. And so why I point this out is when you're identifying flowers, it's always nice to try to look for uh, the pistil, um, which is this typically the tallest part of the flower, and then also the different male parts. Now, you also will see petals, which typically are colorful, uh, with the job to draw pollinators in to pollinate those flowers. Um, and then also surrounding the petals are sepals. So if you've ever seen a lily close, the sepals are what are protecting the petals from the outside world. Okay? So sepals typically help close the flower. And then stem, and then farther down the stem will be the leaves, which you already know that. Mm -hmm. So another thing I wanted to point out is when you look at a flower, like a dandelion, there's actually a lot of flowers on this dandelion. It's not just one flower. Um, because if you, if you take a, a dandelion that um, has gone um, to seed, and you blow it, and you make your wish, you're actually blowing a lot of different flowers um, at once, or a lot of different seeds. And let me explain that. So there are flowers called com uh, compound flowers, where one area hosts a bunch of flowers um, on one stem. So actually, when you're looking at a dandelion, where it looks like petals shooting out, that's one individual flower. And those are called ray flowers. And in the middle of the flower, um, these are all individual flowers as well, and those are called disc flowers. So when a pollinator comes and is marching around uh, the dandelion, it's actually really important because it's pollinating not just one whole flower, a bunch of different little flowers. So something good to remember. So I really like this uh, cross section of uh, a dandelion here, um, where you can see the ray, uh, the ray flowers going out. Think of sunshine rays, and then the disc flowers um, on the inside. Awesome. So we're going to dive into 
Tall flowers. Before we do so, I'm going to try to play a game to keep you interested. Name this flower. The first person gets a sticker. And you name it. Paintbrush. Paintbrush. Awesome. I love it. Who is that? <laughs> I heard you. I heard it back here. And next time, raise your hand so then I can point you out. So, very good. That is a paintbrush. Um, well, what's really interesting is we have nine different types of paintbrush in top. Um, and they all have different names. Uh, wavy leaf paintbrush, also known as apple paste paintbrush, alpine paintbrush, and giant red paintbrush. So if you like to go hiking, you'll see these scarlet gems and sometimes yellow gems um, along the trails. Um, but what's really interesting about uh, paintbrush is that they are a heavy parasite. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, a heavy parasite is a type of flower that um, gets nutrients it parasitizes other plants through the root system and steals nutrients from other plants, but still photosynthesizes and gets nutrients from the sun. So it's able to grow in some poor soil environments because it can attach to other plants and, and rob those nutrients. So heavy parasitism means it does both. Photosynthesizes to get its own nutrients and steals from other, other plants. I don't know if this is going to make you like the plant more or not like the plant more, but typically when it's stealing nutrients from other plants, it's mostly grasses. So then we don't care as much, right? <laughs> um, I saw this was a really beautiful picture. Um, throughout my presentation, there's a uh, local photographer. His name is Steve Ashcraft, and he's uh, he likes to take photos, and he lets me use a lot of them. So he's very helpful when it comes to um, aesthetic presentation. This is a parrot head Indian, uh, Indian paintbrush. All right, so here is, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these flowers before, um, but we have 15 to 17 different types of lupin here in the Tahoe region. Um, so uh, it, that's why it's important to know the different parts of a flower. So if you really want to get interested in specific ID or specific identification, you need to open up the, loop, the lupin you won't be able to see its, its parts. And then you can figure out what type of flower it is based on its, its parts, where it grows, what elevation, and then what the leaves look like. But lupin leaves look like this. So a lot of the times um, when you're hiking, you'll see the leaves first, and as the flowers bloom, uh, you'll know that it is a lupin. So uh, lupin is a really important plant for our Sierra Nevada uh, landscape because it's a nitrogen fixer. So what does that mean? Uh, it takes nitrogen from the air and through this uh, process called nitrogen fixation, it takes that nitrogen and actually makes it so it's in inorganically compounded in the soil, allowing other plants to grow. Which is funny because uh, lupin got its name, I read that it got its name from uh, uh, Canis lupus, which is the Latin name for a wolf. And at the time, everyone thought that wolves were really bad for an ecosystem, and they just ravage, and, um, or they would go into an area and just deplete an ecosystem by what they eat. And so they'd see these lupin growing on the sides of the road in areas where other plants wouldn't grow or in poor soils, and they said, oh, it's similar to a wolf, right? Well, we, both, we now know that wolves are really important for an ecosystem, and also lupin are essential for poor soil areas, uh, allowing other plants to grow by nitrogen fixation. Another thing is um, lupin are buzz pollinated. So in order for uh, these flowers to uh, be able to make more flowers, they need a bee or something that has a, a rhythm or a buzz, to be able to open up the flower in order to get in there. And if you actually are hiking, you can open up the flower and it actually looks like a tube or a thing. So it's kind of cool to check out. Awesome. So I also wanted to point out some flowers that just look alike. Um, so then you can learn a little bit about uh, the three different species that I uh, had trouble with when I first was looking into wildflowers. So white humble flowers. Umble means it has an umbrella-like shape, so a rounded shape that's relatively flat. Now these uh, flowers are in the carrot family, and some ways to differentiate are ranger's mm -hmm. buttons have really large, thick, uh, thick uh, stems with uh, uh, ball-shaped flowers at the tips. 
uh, a cow parsnip, they typically grow pretty tall. They can grow up to five feet. They're, they have really thick stems and very flat tops. And then I see mostly Bruder's Angelica in the area, a little bit more rounded, but it has flat stems um, that uh, open up into the flower. Does Yanfa fall into the same area, right? Yes, it's same in the same, yeah, same family. Yon, yeah. And then um, this is Yarrow. So Yarrow is actually in the sunflower family, so that's why I didn't include it in this, in this slide, um, because uh, because I didn't want us to be confused with carrot versus uh, sunflower. Um, but just like the, um, similar to the uh, dandelion, there's actually little tiny miniature flowers that make up one uh, large area in the flower. Um, so yarrow, uh, its Latin name is Achillea millifolium. Uh, millifolium in Latin means thousand leaves. So in the right hand corner, you can see what the leaves look like. Just little tiny leaves stacked on top of each other. What I really appreciate about these um, these white humble flowers and also yarrow is that they're a perfect landing pad for butterflies. Because unlike hummingbirds, butterflies need to land on a flower in order to consume its nectar. Um, and that's uh, a benefit to having that flat landing pad. Yeah, Jim. Do those uh, flowers in the carrot family have carrot-like Structures. Yes, and a lot of uh, very poisonous flowers are also in the in the um, in the carrot family. I wouldn't go eating anything that we just saw. <laughs> um, all, speaking of Latin too, uh, Achillea. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, indigenous people use um, yarrow as to help with digestion, and so uh, there are some crossover with Achilles being Achilles helping his war his uh, his warriors in battle similar to this plant helping people with gastro issues something like that all right who's seen these in the summer mm -hmm. perfect uh, so uh, you're looking at woolly mule's ear and also arrow leaf balsam root so you're probably looking at this flower and they look very very similar so I wanted to go over a couple different uh, or a couple differences between the two. I really don't like this picture of the uh, arrow leaf balsam root because one of the main differences that you can to be able to tell between the two is that the flowers of the arrow leaf balsam root are typically a lot taller than the leaves. Where woolly mules here, the leaf, the flowers and the leaves are almost at the same height. So from this perspective on the right hand side, you can't necessarily see how tall the uh, uh, arrow leaf balsam root is in compared to the leaves. That's a, the first telltale sign. The next piece is the leaf shape. So uh, on our mule's ear, the reason why it's called a mule's ear is because it looks like a mule's ear. If you were to pick one of the leaves and stick it on your head, you might look like a donkey for a moment. Um, but on the right hand side, it's a lot different shape. It looks like an arrow, or if you turn it around, you want to be romantic, it looks like a heart. But these are also in the sunflower family and are similar to the dandelions, where the very center of the flower are the, who remembers? The disc flowers, and then the petals are actually the ray flowers. flowers. Awesome. And here is that leaf again. So, I have shown you a lot of native flowers in the area, but I wanted to touch on some non-natives that we have or a non-native that we do have. So um, this tool is actually really, really important for an ecosystem because it provides a lot of nutrients for migrating uh, passerines or songbirds. So American goldfinches and smaller birds that are passing through Tahoe love to munch on the really dense um, caloric um, oils that are at the base of these uh, little petals. Now, on the left-hand side is our native thistle. It's called the Anderson, Anderson's thistle, and it looks a lot more uh, tubular. It doesn't have a, more of a base shape. Uh, where on the right-hand side is our non-native thistle, and in a lot of areas, they pull it in the Central Valley. It's a huge issue, and they have um, invasive plant holes and stuff like that. We don't have too much of an issue up here with bull thistle, but it is a non-native plant. Um, and it has more of a, a bulgy uh, base to um, where the sepals are and the filiaries. 
Awesome. So an another flower that you can find that's blue in the area, so a little bit of a change up, is our western blue flag, which is a type of iris. So irises are some of the oldest flowers. Um, and I put this swallowtail butterfly on there just because I have seen swallowtail pollinate uh, these western blue fly irises a lot, and I think that's really unique. Um, uh, an interesting fact about these uh, flowers is um, at its, at its, um, in its bulb, um, Native Americans used to use, it, it's pretty toxic, so they use um, the alkaloids and the toxins in its uh, bulb to uh, put a little bit of poison on their arrows. So I thought it was pretty interesting. And since we are on native land, Washington tribe land, it's always nice to point those things out. Another flower you can find or let me ask you, where, where do you typically find these types of lilies? For those that are creeps. Creeps, yes. Yeah. So they like to be in water of saturated areas. Um, alpine lilies or sarah tiger lily. Um, these are just little gems. So whenever you're, you're hiking up, you're going in desolation, you're tired and you get to a flat meadow area, this is your treat. You see a little bit of stream, a little bit of a spongy, um, so that spongy substrate underneath your feet, and you might see a couple of these uh, orange uh, flowers. And there aren't very many orange flowers in Tahoe. There's lots of yellow flowers, which we won't get into too many today, um, but not very many orange flowers. So they're little treasures in Tahoe. Who knows what type of flower this is? Single lily. Single lily? Close. Close. We don't have single lily here. Yeah. Good job. There goes the lily. Very good. So one thing I wanted to point about, point out about lilies is that all lilies, um, their petals and their stamen, are these? Those are always divisible by three. So that's a nice point. So if we go back to our other lily, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So divisible by three. And same with the Maricosa lily, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's a little hint when you're uh, doing a fire, a fire observation. Now, I don't really know why they named it Maricosa lily, because it's mostly pollinated by uh, this uh, common checkered beetle, uh, but it's still a nice name. But I like to focus on Latin sometimes because it describes the flower a little bit better than the common name. And calicordis means beautiful grass in Latin. And if you notice its stem and where its, where its base is, it looks like grass. Does anybody know what type of, type of flower this is? Wallflower. Perfect. Yes. Smells really good too. And that's actually what I was going to point out. So my favorite smelling wildflower in the Tahoe region is uh, the western wallflower. Um, and I've seen a lot of these uh, wallflowers out at uh, Mount Rose. When I hike up there, it's pretty close to Incline. Um, and they have the most perfume smelling, uh, it's just, it's the best. If I've ever found this new perfume, I'd definitely pick it up. Um, it's just really intense and really good in terms of the smell. All right, so Flocks versus granite gilia. So we went through mules here versus arrowleaf balsam root. And now I'm going to try to tell you the difference between uh, spreading flocks and granite gilia. So both of these grow um, in a lot of different areas throughout high alpine um, habitats. However, on the right hand side, the granite gilia will typically be at 7,500 feet or above. You might also notice that the spreading floss is a bit of a flatter flower and um, is completely open. Where on the right side where the granite gilia is, um, it seems like the flower isn't completely open in comparison to the floss. Now what's really unique about spreading floss is um, they've done some research on it and they've learned that once that flower has been pollinated by a pollinator, it will go from white to pinkish Purple. So once it's been pollinated, it actually will change colors, um, and studies are showing that um, maybe to tell the pollinator that it's already been pollinated and it might not need to be pollinated again. So pretty unique uh, that plants can think too. 
Another flower is the pussy paw. Um, it gets its name because its flowers look like a cat's paw. Notice, um, a lot of you might see this, uh, this flower growing in just really poor soil areas right on the side of the trail, right near a parking lot, um, and with a lot of sun. So uh, these low-lying leaves are called basal leaves, and they're right against the ground. And what's really interesting about pussy paws is that um, when you start your hike in the beginning of the day, the flowers will be on the ground. So the stems and the flowers will be low lying. But once you're done with your, your long hike and you come down the hill, once the sun comes up, they'll actually go towards the sun and lift themselves up um, because they are trying to regulate their temperature. So at nighttime, it's warmer towards the ground except opposed to being up towards the, uh, towards the sky. Um, so keep it warm. And so that's just a way of regulating its temperature. So it's pretty cool to see. Things to notice when you're hiking, besides just hiking. So carnivorous plants. We have a few bogs um, or really wet areas um, here in uh, Tahoe and Truckee, but I'm gonna encourage you guys to find out where those are. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, iNaturalist and how you can find hot spots. So are carnivorous plants, why do you think they are carnivorous? Who can give me a guess? Why would a plant need to be carnivorous? Because they don't get enough nutrients from the soil. Yes, because they can't get nutrients from the soil. So they live in uh, areas with nutrient deficient habitats, and so they need to find nutrients in different ways. Um, and so that's why they consume insects and other things. So um, here is a brown leaf sundew, one of our um, carnivorous plants. <coughs> and this is a Tahoe uh, wildflower talk. But if you drive down to Nevada City or Grass Valley, which isn't too far, there's a lot of different carnivorous plant areas, and that's where you can find the pitcher plants, which are pretty cool to see too. They're super cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, this is another flower similar to groundsels, which they can be difficult to tell apart, but asters and daisies look very, very similar. Um, but the best way to tell the difference is um, are the blooming season, so it's nice to know what time they'll, they'll bloom in terms of the year, and also counting the filiaries on the back of the, on the underside of the flower. So these, it's not the sepal, but the filiaries. So it's not very fun. I actually don't really identify them very much. Um, I'll just say, oh, it's an aster or a daisy, and then I'll just walk along. But that's my personal preference. Um, but if you ever were to want to really get into wildflower ID, there's a lot of different ways um, uh, to identify those flowers. And Kendall, again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, name this flower. Columbine, awesome. Ordinary. I think, yeah, she's not saying a lot of the flowers. Yeah. Perfect. So crimson columbine um, is also a scarlet gem that inhabits the Tahoe area. And where does this also grow near? By creeks. So wet, moist areas, um, meadow habitat, sometimes, or a lot of times I see it in the shade. Um, so uh, this flower, because it has these long nectaries, they're pollinated by hummingbirds. So uh, and it's hummingbirds, as they fly through, and they migrate um, through the area, sometimes um, <clears throat> coming from the Cascade Range, they need a lot of uh, nutrition, and the Crimson Columbine provides that. And also one of the symbiotic adaptations is that it hangs down in order for that uh, hummingbird to come and pollinate from underneath. Fun fact is that um, hummingbirds, they fly in a figure eight pattern, so they're one of the few birds that can hover while flying, um, instead of just flapping their wings this way. So fun story is there's another type of uh, columbine, uh, alpine columbine, that occurs um, along the, it's like near Yosemite and Myrtle Lake and high elevation areas as well. And it's a lot longer and a little bit larger than our crimson columbine. And that's specifically pollinated by sphinx moths. But then they found out that there are some hybrid, these two flowers were hybridizing, but they couldn't figure out how they were hybridizing. And then they found out that these, uh, these little bees, short tongued bees, were cheating 
and they were going and just chewing little holes going straight to the nectar while still getting a little bit of pollen on them and um, hybridizing both of those um, both of those flowers. Um, whereas columbine is specific to hummingbirds and sphinx moths are specific to alpine columbine, but those bees like snuck in and kind of caused some havoc. So it's always fun when that happens. Who's seen corn lily before? Awesome. This also grows near water, um, and they, when it starts to bloom, it can also be about five feet tall. Um, but this plant is very toxic um, uh, in terms of its leaves, um, and have been. It can cause pretty a lot of distress if it was consumed by anything, whether it's a mammal or or or, uh, or any sort of animal. So definitely don't go chewing on those leaves, because <laughs> um, it is a very toxic plant. Orchids. So we actually have quite a few orchids in the area, um, with our most popular being our rain orchid. Um, that also grows near a uh, wet, uh, wet area. And notice the name, the spelling, rain is spelled like precipitation. It's spelled as if it is uh, a horse rain, because that's why it was named after, because it looks like horse rain. I don't get it, um, but that's why it was named or coined. Uh, but something I wanted to focus on is Colorado also um, is a, an area where some rare plants can be found. And we had a, a competition, or more so just a an activity that was year round for people to come out and identify as many wildflower species they can see in a calendar year. And um, an enthusiast, his name is Bob Sweat, he was looking around and he was looking um, around Emerald Bay and he found this stream orchid on the right hand side. And you know, he, he sends us a few messages about it. And this flower right here hadn't occurred in the Tahoe region since 1950. And so was re spotted again in um, 2018 or 19. And um, was just a, a, a new piece to see in the area. So even, at, he's not a novice anymore, but he began that way. And um, from just learning and just going out there and getting involved, he was able to find a flower that hasn't been found since the 50s. Um, there is some speculation because I guess there might have been a scientist that saw uh, this orchid uh, around Emerald Bay, but they didn't announce it. So who's the first to announce that they saw it? So we're going to give him credit to it. Um, there also has been uh, stream orchids found by Glenbrook, um, which is a, a private homeowner area on the East Shore. So it's been found, it's been found there as well. Yes. Is there a name for stream orchid? The flower itself. That's a good question. I actually never saw it, but I wanted to include the story. But I'll get back to you on that. So this is uh, probably my favorite flower in Tahoe. It is one of the most common flowers in Tahoe. So you're probably wondering why. Well, number one, it smells so good. It smells like mint. Um, and whenever I take people on hikes or I take kids backpacking out in the wilderness, um, I like to have them rub some of the flowers between their hands. It just is a calming, relaxing smell. Um, what I also like about the Mountain Penny Royal is it's pollinated by a lot of different things. Um, I like the symbiotic relationships and bees, butterflies, ants, beetles, wasps, a lot of different pollinators are able to uh, utilize this plant for a food source. So it's one of my favorite ones in the area. And it's very, very popular. And I actually said it the wrong way. It's the, it's the leaves that smell really good, not the flower. So um, don't pick the flower, um, pick the leaf, uh, and then rub it between your fingers and it smells like mint. Is it um, Yes, you could actually make a tea out of Mountain Penny Royal. I don't suggest they have a, a, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't drink eight cups if you're pregnant, is what I've read. So, <laughs> I would drink a lot less than eight cups, number one. And then number two, um, maybe just avoid it if you're pregnant. But it is a, a drinkable tea if you wanted to look into uh, wild wildflower um, uh, medicinal and edible uses. So here is my example of wildflowers and plants driving me crazy, okay? So also being really interesting. So flowers 
When they were first categorized um, in uh, lilies or sunflowers, they were categorized based on phys physical attributes. Like, for example, a lily, it has, it's divisible by six, and it has this specific component. But then they started doing genetic testing on flowers, and then they started moving everything around. And it happens every few years that some of your favorite, you've memorized a bunch of Latin, and then they change it. <laughs> so um, this is an example that what I say today might change in a few years. Um, and that's what's really exciting about wildflowers and plants in general, is that there's always something new, there's always something to be discovered, and there's always something to learn. So prior to this presentation, I had to go through and check the Latin on Calc Flora with most of the flowers to make sure they were still accurate. Um, so you're welcome. <laughs> um, but the monkey flower, why I'm saying this specifically to monkey flowers, it was one of my first genuses I learned in college, which is Nimulus. And so every time I see a monkey flower, I would say, oh, Nimulus, and I'd maybe say the, the exact species name. But then they decided to divide it into multiple categories and then reshift it in other different directions. So um, now the placus is a category of monkey flower, and Mimulus is also a category of monkey flower. So again, things change. And these are for the ones that are really, really interested in plant ID and what, but we'll move on. Oh, before we do, um, what's interesting about monkey flowers is once they are pollinated, they're also, they'll also close their petals a little bit. And the Calliope hummingbird, which is our smallest bird in uh, the United States, pollinates monkey flowers. So it's cute. And a lot of times monkey flowers are just a few inches off the ground, so it makes it even more cute. Onion. So we have a couple different types of onion. Um, I really like uh, to dig up the bulbs of onion. And uh, if a, a, a student is an amazing student of the day at backpacking camp, because there's only so much you can give them, I'll give them a wild onion bowl. And they'll be like, what the heck? But it's still fun. They, they feel like they're important for the day, because they are. Um, but it's, it's nice to dig up those, and you can have little snacks while you're hiking. Again, it, there's an important rule that picking wildflowers, you want to make sure, depending at uh, the area that you're at, it's allowed. State parks are not allowed to pick up things. Uh, federal land, it's different. So knowing the area where you want to forage, and also being mindful of if you do want to pick wildflowers, you want to make sure there's a lot of wildflowers there just to pick one. So I'm not trying to get everyone just start picking everything you see, but um, there are some cool medicinal and edible uses um, all in our backyards. Pinstamen is uh, another tubular flower found throughout the area. We have um, how many? Seven different types of pinstamen. Um, Mountain pride are what grow out of granite cracks. If you're driving on Highway 80 or Highway 50, you see all these granite slabs, this bright pink fuchsia flower coming out, probably mountain pride. I wanted to point out, I know this is a blurry picture, but I can find a different one. Um, the mountain pride flower is actually the mascot of the California Native Plant Society's Chicago chapter. So um, I wanted to point that out. California fuchsia is not a uh, pinstamen, but also is pollinated by hummingbirds, just like our pinstamens um, on the previous slide. Firebee, who's ever been to Alaska? Mm. Okay, so I love fireweed, but I also have, it pulls at my heartstrings because fireweed, especially in Alaska or at the end of Tahoe summer, is letting us know that summer's almost over and fall is about to begin. So it's a, a phenology piece. Um, but fireweed also grows in actually nutrient dense areas um, where uh, a fire has occurred. Um, and then puts a lot of nutrients back in the soil, and so they're able to, to grow very well. Um, so uh, you can see fireweed in old burn areas um, and, throughout, and throughout other areas, too. Shooting stars are another flower that you can see in uh, marshland or wet habitat, um, and is also buzz pollinated. So you can see the bee on the right-hand side buzzing and hanging from that flower. So pretty cool to see it as well. All right, so another flower, if you want to go hiking to try to find this one, uh, I see a lot of the times when I was visiting my ranger friend Sam in Desolation Wilderness, 
but the alpine heather, these little tiny, really tiny little flowers, looks like upside down in cups. And um, it was actually John Muir's uh, favorite flower of this year in Nevada, and he called it the fairest and dearest. Um, so just thought I'd throw that in there too. All right, our game again. Wake back up. No flower. No snow, plant. snow plant, perfect, awesome. So snow plants are very, very cool. Um, they are in the category of mycoheterotrophs. So I'll say it again, mycoheterotrophs. Now it's your turn to say it. Mycoheterotrophs. Perfect, awesome. Mycoheterotrophs are plants that don't use uh, leaves, uh, uh, they don't grow um, green leaves, they don't produce chlorophyll, which is the pigment that allows photosynthesis to get food, right? So they lack chlorophyll, they lack that green <laughs> pigment, and instead the way that they get food is by tapping into root systems of trees that are nearby and stealing nutrients from, uh, my, uh, say it for me, Kendall, uh, mycelium, so different, uh, or mycorrhiza, sorry, that's what it's called, mycorrhiza. So mycorrhiza basically is uh, an or organism that helps plants get nutrients and grow. I don't know where that turned out. And it's basically just like a web of um, little white strands that are underneath the soil that help those trees grow. So what these plants do is it taps into the soil and it finds the mycorrhiza and then parasitizes the mycorrhiza in the soil. So a lot of times people thought that the snow plant was tapping into the tree roots. It's not. It's, it's tapping into the mycorrhiza that's helping tree roots absorb water and nutrients. So kind of confusing, something very weird to learn that you can talk about at your next dinner party. Um, <laughs> but snow plants are a treasure here. I've seen all around the disc golf course at in, in the Incline Village disc golf, disc golf course. And then pine drops are the ones in the middle. I've seen them all over the forest. Um, they can grow in dark areas because, again, they don't need sunlight. I've actually only seen one fringed pine sap. And that was in Truckee. Um, has anybody else seen a fringed pine sap? You have? Yeah, I've only seen one, but still another cool uh, microheterotroph. Do you call them parasites too, or not? Um, they technically are. They are they parasitizing. They aren't giving back, right? Yeah, no, they're definitely taking, they're absorbing uh, uh, nutrients and stealing nutrients from that mycorrhizal uh, fungi, but they're not really harming the trees too much. It's just stealing just enough where it's not going to kill a tree or really damage uh, the symbiotic relationship between the two, but it still is parasitizing. So it is a parasite, but a really beautiful, cool one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of things are parasites, actually, um, surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly. Uh, something also uh, to note is that snow plant is pollinated by hummingbirds too. So they have that scarlet red to attract hummingbirds because again, they are a plant. They do produce seeds and pollen and nectar. Um, so they need to be pollinated by something and that is a hummingbird. All right, we have just a few flowers left. Yes. When I was growing up, we were always told that it was against the law to pick the snow plants. Is that true or was that just like a something our parents told us to get us to not pick them. Okay, so that is something that I've investigated. I've spent so much time investigating that, and I have not found one rule anywhere that states <laughs> that it's illegal to pick a specific snow plant, but I think they didn't want people to pick snow plants. So this uh, weird rumor started to occur, and it's illegal to pick it, but in, in general, in some areas like state parks and some territories, um, you can't pick anything. It's not just snow plants. You can't pick a dandelion. You can't pick up a pine cone. So just knowing your regulations of where you want to forage is really important. Kendall. Yeah, just add that they are only found really in the Sierra Nevada in the very southern tip of the Cascades. So they're rare to this area, which is another reason that, <laughs> that they were like kind of protected by someone even if yeah, so those that are, uh, that are putting a little rock structures around the snow plant, if you go hiking, there's like 30 rocks, there's like a rock temple all around the snow plant. Good on them. At least they, they believe in the, 
the protection, which is which is good to do. Um, larkspur is actually a pretty toxic plant. Um, there's two different types of larkspur. The one on the right hand side is nettles, um, and it's pretty short uh, to the ground, opposed to the towering larkspur that can grow eight feet tall. I find a lot of that in uh, wet areas as well. Um, I need to speak through this. Um, we have a lot of time. Elephant's head is a very unique plant. Um, we have our little elephant's head on the right hand or left hand side, and also uh, elephant's head on the right hand side, and uh, they look like an elephant, which is a really cool thing. Um, they're in the same family as uh, paintbrush, and they also are a hemi parasite. Another pretty cool one too. You guys remember what a hemi parasite is, right? It can still can still photosynthesize, but also uh, parasitize other plants if it needs more nutrients. We have endemic flowers in the area, meaning that they only grow here in Tahoe. And two examples are the Tahoe yellowcress and the Tahoe grava. The Tahoe yellowcress uh, grows at beaches. And at one point in 1996, there was only 10 sites that it grew. It's in the mustard family and spreads by underground rhizomes. So when its uh, habitat is kicked around by a dog off leash, um, it can really uh, hurt that plant. So they started putting up fences in uh, areas around the upper trophy marsh, and now, especially in drought years, uh, the plant is doing a lot better. Um, we do have a lot of different types of edibles in the area. Uh, thimbleberry grows all over uh, saturated, moist um, um, drainage areas. Uh, we also have blueberry here in the, top, in, the, in the region. I've seen most blueberry plants on the west shore. Um, if you want to try to scavenge for those. Um, through here, burn areas, uh, mountain white thorn, the, the flower or the plant on the left hand side, um, produces this really nice smelling um, flower in the summertime. And where I like to find morels, as the very tips of the white thorn by white firs as well. So that's a good area um, to look for morels. Let's get into where we can find these, these plants. Um, first thing is you want to choose your season, where, what time you want to go. Because um, that's going to determine maybe what wildflowers you're going to find. And then also the elevation and aspect of where you're looking for those flowers. So some areas have a lot more sunlight, opposed to more shadows during the daytime. Um, so make sure that you do your research a little bit before go, going and looking for certain flowers. Using field guides is uh, highly recommended, and I'll show you on the next slide. Again, being considerate, taking only photos and leaving only footprints. And if you do decide to collect, Make sure there's a prevalence of those flowers before taking one. And then come prepared. The best way, in my, my opinion, to learn wildflowers is to draw them. So we'll, have, we'll host a couple wildflower sketching illustration classes this summer. And so it will be a, a fun way to learn flowers a little bit more. Field guides I recommend on the right hand side is a Sierra Nevada John Muir Lost Field Guide. So if you open up a, an actual plant field guide, it will be differentiated by the families. And that's not that easy to, to work with. With the John Muir Lives field guide, it allows uh, folks to, how many, uh, what color is the flower? How many petals are on the flower? Um, what the leaves look like on the flower? And that's how it's differentiated with the field guide. So it's a better, a beginner look. Um, the left-hand side is, is an outdated book, so the Latin isn't very correct, but I love his descriptions, and uh, uh, in terms of information, just get an old copy of this book if you're really into it, because I, I really like what he has to say. So North Shore Hotspots. Tahoe Meadows, great place to find flowers. Mount Rose, Green Lake Peak Road, and then uh, Sage Hill Meadows. Here's Tahoe Meadows here. Mount Rose and Relay Peak Road, that picture was taken there. Um, also, you can see uh, the lack of pigment in the lupin on the uh, on Mount Rose. Uh, they, they're more so white, um, but the ultraviolet um, uh, coloration still attracts bees to be able to pollinate it. So it's pretty cool. Kind of an interesting flower to look for. Is that growing in wet places or dry? Open sun up on Mount Rose, right? For uh, uh, sandy, slopey yeah. areas, yeah. you can find right. lupin. Yeah. Right. This is the woody fruited evening primrose. Uh, it's a very interesting flower that I see up at Mount Rose, too. 
Sage and Meadows, it's not on necessarily North Shore, it's more in Truckee, but this is a Camas lily. There's a whole field of them. It's by the Station Research Station. Very, uh, a very beautiful area to check out um, in the early part of the year. So May um, is probably one of the best times to find it, depending on the precipitation and snow pack. Mm -hmm. Shirley Canyon uh, in Olympic Valley, California. Here's a tip, going up the canyon, and um, you'll see just the different topographic elevation change and a lot of different flowers along the way because you're following the drainage and you see a bunch of water waterfalls. But the very top is just full of flowers. And the best part is you can take the tram down in the summer and then if you can catch it in time, and it's free if you take it just down. So it's one way up and then you don't have to hurt your knees going back down. So I really like that, uh, that trip. East Shore Hot Spots, Genoa Peak, Tunnel Creek, Logan House, and Snow Valley Peak. Tunnel Creek's a great area. It is pretty uh, sandy, um, but as you go up more towards the drainage area, you can get a lot more uh, uh, wildflowers. South Shore Hotspot. South Shore hosts a lot of areas that have pretty amazing wildflower area, uh, spot. So anywhere you go in Desolation, you're going to find a ton of wildflowers. Um, anywhere. Uh, Carson Pass, Lake, Lake Winnemucca is probably the most popular area to go up for wildfires, and it's not popular in, in terms of everyone's going there, and it's, it's so beautiful, you should definitely check it out. Even if there is a lot of people on the trail, try to go midweek, but it's amazing. It's just flowers as tall as your head, you have those towering water spur, just an amazing area to go look for, look for flowers. But we want the time for South Asian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, West Shore Hot Spots, so Meeks Creek is a really good area. I, I hold some wildflower outings out there. Barker Pass, Blackwood Canyon, Lake Forest Beach. Here's Meeks Creek. You like right. water, water too. Yeah, that water creeks. Really nice. There's a lot of water up there. Anywhere that you just look on a map and you see a drainage, go look for wildfires there. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good tip. Um, but now I'm going to pass it on to Kendall, who's going to talk about the wildflower big year, which is an opportunity that you can be. Yeah, so we're really excited to be talking about wildflowers uh, today in particular because a month from today, on April 1st, we're kicking off our 2022 Wildflower Big Year, uh, which is a event that will be happening throughout the wildflower season um, all year long. And there are some different elements to Wildflower Big Year in different ways to get involved that I'd like to uh, point out. Uh, the first one is that it is a competition. So if you're into the competitive stuff, competitive stuff motivates you to learn new flowers. Um, we are hosting a project on iNaturalist.org. Has anybody heard my app mm -hmm. before or used it? Okay, yeah. So it's a citizen science app where you can upload uh, observations or photos of plants, animals, anything you find. And it's got a social uh, component to so that others can also help you to identify the pictures that you take. Okay, so if you've got your field guides, you don't know what it is, or if you're like, oh, there's only one of this flower in this whole area, maybe it's kind of rare and I should upload it so others can know about it too, right? Um, you can upload it to iNaturalist, uh, and I'll play a little bit more about that in this next slide. So the way this works is we have created a project within iNaturalist, and it encompasses this whole region where the wildflower big year of Tahoe is taking place. Um, outlined in this kind of orange area on the map. Uh, the project automatically includes all plant observations within that area for the whole year. So you don't even have to worry about adding observations to the project. They're added automatically if you upload an observation. Uh, right now, our director, Dr. Will, is the number one observer, so we need people to get in there. I'll observe him. <laughs> uh, and as you can see, these are some of the most recent observations in the project. We have a lot of trees and shrubs at this point. We don't have a lot of wildflowers quite yet. Uh, but we expect you know, to get a lot of observations in the months to come. Uh, Sarah kind of briefly mentioned that iNaturalist is also a really great spot to look for areas where you can find flowers. So if you're looking for a specific flower, you're like, You've got to get my, you know, my primrose, I gotta get my uh, steer's head, something like that. Um, you can go on INAT and you can see like date and time of when people have uh, observed these plants and go to those exact locations and look for them. Um, the citizen science aspect also helps us to track like 
the spread of the orchids, the stream orchids, sort of they kind of started to come back and spread out a little bit over the Tahoe region. Um, if you haven't used iNaturalist before, you, there is an app for iPhone and Android users, and there's also a website. Uh, some people prefer the app. I like the app. A lot of like more biology people prefer the website and uploading pictures that way. If you're like a big photography person, the website seems to work better. Um, but there's different ways to use iNaturalist. I will say that it's not super intuitive. It takes a little bit of training to use iNaturalist. Don't be scared about that because we have some training to be offered this year. Um, and iNaturalist also has some training available. This link uh, will give you some video tutorials about how to interact with the app in a way that's going to hopefully get you people to help identify uh, your observations and how to take you know, good pictures for the app so that we can identify them, so we're getting you know, those sepals and flowers and leaves and all the parts of the plant that you need in order to identify them. Um, so there's lots of great video tutor tutorials at this link if you're interested in using iNaturalist. I think you guys are beautiful. All right, and then outside of iNaturalist, if you're not big on the tech stuff, you can also just come out on some field excursions with us. Um, right now, we don't have a lot set in stone as far as like dates for wildflower walks because that all kind of depends on when the snow comes and goes, right? When the flowers arrive. Um, but we will be adding a lot of wildflower walks to our calendar at this link. Um, so you can always check the calendar in the upcoming months for events. As Sarah mentioned, they're free and open to the public. Um, and we're going to try to you know, get them around in all kinds of different locations around the lake. Uh, you can also put your name and email on this list right up here once we finish in just a minute. And then we'll send you our monthly newsletter and any wildflower uh, information and updates throughout the year. Uh, you can also, as I mentioned, upload observations to iNaturalist if you want to do things on your own. Uh, on top of just wildflower walks, we're also going to be offering wildflower photography focused walks. Um, we've got some really great volunteers who are better photographers than Sarah and I and can teach you how to use cameras uh, that, uh, in a way that is going to capture wildflowers really well. Uh, we'll have a couple classes uh, dealing with gardening with our native plants and the wildflowers. And also, as Sarah mentioned, sketching is a really, really great way to learn plants and learn flowers in particular. So we'll also have uh, some wildflower sketching events. And again, all of these will be on our calendar, or you can sign up for email uh, to learn more about them. Cool. So um, I was going to open it to any questions for you know two minutes or so. Does anybody have any questions about wildflowers, where to find them, membership, how to be involved? Yes. I'll definitely join, but I'm at Kleiner. I own Comstock Seed Farm in Gardnerville. And it's very lovely in the spring. We grow lots of pentamens. Oh, cool. Lots of native grasses, and we have about 150 native flowers in stock in seed form. And so we work with the local uh, nurseries in the valley and the TRPA and a lot of the restoration work. Yeah, the parking lot, all the ski resorts, we do lots of watershed work from the seed side. But you're all welcome down anytime. We bring groups down, we get tours all the time. And definitely contact us because we're looking for more um, uh, more partners with mm -hmm. our wildflower big year. And we, we plug a lot of uh, nurseries in the area, especially if they, uh, they do specialize in native planting. Um, and sometimes we'll do events with uh, various organizations. So, so yeah, just give your give your card at the end. Say your name. Ed Kleiner, uh, Comstock Seed Farms, or on 88. Perfect. Yeah, but Silver Buckley was one of my favorites. You missed that one. So, uh, yeah, so there's so many. I mean, there's over a thousand different yeah. flowers. In, yes, in, there there's over a thousand, and I just try to pick some of the ones yeah. that I enjoy. Yeah. But yeah, Silver Buckley is a very beautiful plant that's all over the rocks and the ledges of Tahoe. Any other questions before we get going? Uh, thank you so much. Yeah.